Difficult. Um, so I declare the meeting open to the public. For now in public session, can I remind members that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online. Uh, I want to advise you all there are four members attending uh, the meeting in person today and we have currently got one member uh, attending via, via video conference. The members that are present in person are myself, Emma Sheeran, Mike Nesbitt, the Vice Chair, Paula Bradshaw and Michelle McElveen. And John O'Dowd uh, is attending in his capacity today as Carol McCullen's Deputy. Uh, members, you'll recall that we previously agreed to appoint deputies who can attend in a member's place if they are unable to do so. And obviously, Carol has been uh, appointed the temporary uh, Minister for Communities, and, and we wish her well in that post. <laughs> Mark Durkin isn't able to join us at the minute. He's had uh, a, a, an emergency come up, but he might be able to, to join later on in the meeting. So um, if we get him on Starleaf, we'll, um, we'll welcome him in at that point. Using Starleaf today, I would ask all members to ensure that their mobile phone is on Wi-Fi to avoid interference with the video conferencing facilities. Um, I'd like to remind you all that I'm going to invite you to speak before you can be seen and heard in the meeting, and I'll rotate around the room uh, initially and then call the, the members or member who's dialed in through Starleaf so as to ensure that nobody is missed. And I'll let the witnesses know when they're being brought in. Uh, when I do invite you to speak, if you wait for a few seconds for your camera and microphone to be activated and selected before you begin to speak, you don't need to activate your microphone or deactivate it. This is going to be controlled by the meeting moderator uh, who will take their cues from ourselves and hope that's all clear. And we'll turn to agenda item number one. So initially we've got apologies. So as I've previously mentioned, Mark Durkin is currently unable to attend, but he might join us later on the meeting. Uh, we've been advised that we have an apology from Christopher Stalford, who is unwell at the minute. And if members are happy, I'd suggest that we send him a wee get well soon card from the committee. Happy enough? Mm -hmm. for that. Right, so uh, chairperson's business. Okay, so if members are happy, um, I want to take a wee minute to speak about the summer recess. So other committees have taken the decision to meet throughout the summer, um, and I know there's varying urgency with, with some of, of the other committee business. I don't really feel that it's necessary for this committee to, to meet through summer recess. Happy to take views on this, but I'm just conscious that the clerk and the other staff are only able to take leave when the assembly is in recess, and if we start to meet throughout July, that affects their ability to take holidays, and obviously everyone has a right to a break. So, if members want to give a view on this, I, I agree. I don't think it's urgent. We're obviously keeping going with the health committee because obviously of the COVID regs and stuff, but I don't think in this case it's necessary. Yeah, content with that. Concur. Yeah. So everyone's happy. So, if if we continue then with normal recess and we'll have the, the next meeting in July and then after that we'll, we'll break for summer. So the minutes the minutes for our last meeting held on the 4th of June are page 6 of your meeting packs. Are members content with the minutes as drafted? Content. Yeah. Okay. Dokey. Okay. Next item on the agenda, <coughs> item number 4, the matters are rising. Um, and you'll find in page 11 of your pack, you've got the clerk's memo on the executive office expert panel. At our last meeting, we had a number of concerns about the expert panel, and as a committee, we've written to the executive office for further information. Uh, the clerk's memo highlights some key considerations for us in thinking about how we wish to hear from the panel going forward. It's up to us as the committee to determine how and when we hear from the panel. Um, so members might want to, the panel to examine issues collectively, and this would allow panel members to debate opposing views, highlighting differences of opinion, and identifying areas of agreement and commonality. Officials from the Executive Office have suggested that the panel could alternatively act as five individuals from whom the committee could request individual pieces of work. As a guide, the Executive Office is asking panel members to each commit around two days per month, depending on the committee's needs. We would choose to hear from the panel at regular intervals. We could commission specific pieces of work as needed, or we could have a mixture of both. And I think we had a slight con or a small conversation there uh, before the meeting started. Just I know this was discussed at the last meeting, but it's probably important to remember at this time that this is an agreement from NDNA. Um, 
So it's the executive office that have really <coughs> over the panel of experts, how they're appointed, how they're remunerated, how much um, time they're uh, ex expected to be paid for. We then have to take a view on, on how we want to interact with them. So if members have views, Mike? Yes, Chair. Um, <coughs> well, <coughs> excuse me. First of all, I accept it's a commitment in NDNA, but that was a period of time, that was a fixed moment in time when these uh, proposals were agreed. Um, one of them has already been overturned, which was that there would be a Brexit subcommittee, uh, and the Executive Office has taken a, a view that rather than set up a Brexit subcommittee, the Executive itself would meet in EU withdrawal format. So there is a precedent there for amending parts of the new decade, new approach. Um, I'm now questioning in my own mind what was the logic of saying there would be a panel of five, particularly having heard that they're going to be on £500 per day, uh, which means you know, you're know, you talking about ten grand a month if it's two days a month for five people. Factor into that the fact that Caroline the Clark is saying that there are experts who are coming forward to give their views without asking for remuneration. And it seems to me that um, we should rethink whether we need a panel of five uh, at that cost. And I would propose, I listen to views, but at the moment I would propose we write to the executive office and say we're not happy. Uh, we don't think it's necessary to have a panel of five uh, at that cost. I know it's their decision, but remember, it will be this committee uh, who will be uh, exposed by the media as costing potentially over £100,000 uh, in expert witness fees. I, I mean, I, I would take your, your view. If we had a conversation about this at the last meeting. I just think that, I mean, it's, it's a commitment in NDNA. So was the Brexit. Yeah, but <laughs> Bill of Rights, it's been quite a controversial topic. We're now 12 years after we had, I mean, it's, it's an agreement in 1998, so that's 22 years down the line. And if we start to now open up the process by which the panel are appointed, we're, I, I'm concerned that we potentially are kicking the can down the road and, and, no, and further <coughs> having a conversation. Paula, Absolutely don't want to do that. Sorry, Chair. I don't want to do that. I don't want to kick the can down the road. If you can persuade me why we need five paid experts, then I'll change my mind. Well, that, it's not our view. It's not our, our role to do that. It's not in the remit of this committee. It was set out as being the remit of TEO, and and they have the responsibility. Paula, if you want to, thank you. I'm um, just ready to follow on, and I certainly would concur, and I'd be happy to um, second the proposal made by Mike. Um, I don't think that us putting our concerns to the executive office or the executive table around this uh, would in any way undermine our work and the future work programme we have in front of us. I am still struggling as to how they will help us facilitate the end product, so to speak. And I certainly agree that the um, quality of the input to date, and obviously we have a couple more contributors today, has been excellent. And so I think there will be a role where, where people will have to get us to sort of amalgamate that and amass that into, to a final product. But I'm not sure the five, we need five um, expert panel members going forward at this stage. I, I wouldn't be supportive of doing that. I think that we're opening up. I mean, this, the, there was, we had three years of no assembly. We had a lengthy and exhaustive talks process. And this was one of the key commitments out of the agreement that was reached at that point. And for us to start then well, can I, can I, around the edges of that, I, I don't know if they're well, worth it. I suppose, well, well, I think that would probably then have to go to the vote as, as such, you know, in terms of the proposal. But I do think that it could be a qualified um, letter to the executive office to say there is a range of opinions around the table, but these were some of the principal concerns. So I don't think that in any way we're trying to roll back on what was discussed or agreed as part of the talks mm -hmm. process. Okay. Michelle? Sure. Ultimately, ultimately, the decision will lie with the Executive Office anyway, so I actually don't see why there would be any issue in expressing concerns in relation to the expenditure which would be put against this, um, this process. Um, obviously, we voiced our opinion a couple of weeks ago, and members 
opinions haven't changed in that time. So I think just maybe just formally expressing that, whether it's accepted or not, really isn't much that we can do about that, but at least we're putting it on the record. Bring John, have you anything to add? Well, um, this quite clearly always should be cons uh, a, a concern or a registration of um, remarks around costs at any committee or any public service. Uh, un unfortunately, or fortunately, from other side of, of the debate, you're on our side of the table, you're on. Uh, this is the going rate for the services the committee requires. Um, I think, in terms of the number of for the committee, that, that is a matter for the, the executive office. It's a matter for the executive committee. Uh, and I would be concerned that we are in danger of mission creep. Uh, that we talk about everything other than what the committee is supposed to be talking about in terms of a Bill of Rights. Um, if, if the committee clerk wishes to draw up a letter to the executive office reflecting the, the, the views around the table, then I'd be happy to look at it at the next meeting, um, if that will assist the process. Does anyone have any further views? Yeah, Chair, the, the only thing I would say about John's proposal that we draw up a letter for the next meeting is I think the process of appointing the panel is active. So I think it is uh, time sensitive that the committee, if we are going to do so, make a point to the, to the executive office that while we are not against expert advice, <clears throat> that we already know that there are experts coming forward without charge. We feel that five at the going rate uh, is excessive. Uh, we note that they've already amended NDNA in terms of the Brexit subcommittee and therefore feel there's a precedent to reviewing whether we need a panel of five, uh, which we, we think maybe is generous. I, I'm almost, I'm almost, I feel almost that you've <clears throat> potentially proven my point in, in your initial remark there. In that this is time sensitive, this process is underway. Six months after it was agreed, as per what is currently happening, the the deadline is already we're what four weeks, five weeks behind what they had hoped for in terms of having their panel appointed, and now we're going to to write to them, expressing concerns or asking that they change. Because of the cost, chair. Sure. Well, that was what was agreed. That is the. No, I never agreed rate. five hundred pounds a day. That, no, that, that was what it, the process was agreed in NDNA <clears throat> that executive yes. office would have remit for this. And yes, and that now is, that I hear that it's £500 pounds a day for five people, I'm dead against it. Right. It's not for this committee to decide, though. No, but it is perfectly within our remit to express an opinion. Well, we can, we can, we can write to the executive office expressing that some members have reservations. Or are dead against um, an element of it. Um, it's not something that I feel personally. So, I mean, if we draw up a letter and have members look at it, or I don't know what way we would work that. We're, we're yeah, I'm not, not having to go here, but we do not have concerns about this committee being examined in terms of value for money. We're talking about a bill of rights. No. <clears throat> so we, 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 it, is, it, is our, it is our role to examine the evidence that we're presented with and to work with the people that have been appointed to come up with a report to try and achieve and deliver a Bill of Rights, something that we're now over 20 years in the making. Yes. So, I, do, I mean, we can talk about cost, but this is about rights. Well, I'm not talking about value for money, and I don't think we're exempt from delivering value for money. Across the public sector, people employed in these sorts of roles, that is the going rate. Yes. I didn't set that rate. But the I'm executive not, I'm office. Not arguing about the rate. I'm arguing about giving five people that rate. Is that value for money? Do we need five? Oh, I thought you were arguing about the rate. No. I'm saying given the rate. So it's the number of people? Yes. So what would you propose? That the executive office re look at whether we need five. We can. Uh, we can ask the clerk to draft a letter that we can then have oversight of, and if we're happy, we can send that letter. 
With respect, Chair, sure. there are three people in the room who have concerns and expressed those concerns two weeks ago. And all we're asking for is that a letter go. A, a letter has already been sent to the Executive reflect, Office asking reflecting, for clarity. Reflecting those concerns. Those weren't the concerns at the last meeting. <clears throat> There were, there were questions. No, the language "dead against" is being used. That that wasn't that wasn't reflected at the last meeting. Uh, with respect, Chair, I think I'm kind of concerned in relation to your attitude in re with regards to this, and you're not allowing members then just to express their view, and you're being very argumentative. And it's it's, it's pretty clear that there is there are concerns. Yes, Michelle. And that they then should be reflected. Everyone has spoken. Everyone has been allowed to present their views. The last meeting, members asked that a letter would be sent. The letter has been sent. At that stage, it was asking a question. Now, members are telling me that they're dissatisfied with the number of people that are being paid the rate and that they want to write to the Executive Office asking them to change the process. That's an accurate reflection of what's happened here. So I'm saying that that's not something that I would be in support of. I can ask the clerk to draft a letter, and if we're happy, we can send the letter. Okay, with, with respect, Chair, I'm not asking for the process to be changed. I'm asking for the outcome to change. The outcome being not to have five. That was agreed as part of the process, Chair. as part of NDNA. Yes, John. Um, I am slightly confused in terms of exactly what Mike is asking for because he just previously stated that he wanted to write to the executive. Um, asking them to review whether five was necessary. Now he's saying he objecting to it being five. Um, so we need a firm propose exactly what is being asked of us to endorse. What exactly uh, are those people? Uh, and we all have, well, every, obviously everybody will have concerns about the cost. I'm not dismissing concerns about the cost. But what exactly are we being asked to do at the committee today? I would like us to write to the Executive Office and say that uh, where we are now, given our experience over since this committee was established and the number of experts who are coming forward gratis, we wish the Executive Office to review whether we need a panel of five experts given the going rate and value for money. We don't see the rationale for a panel of five. Uh, well, apologies again, as I'm obviously only new into the committee. Um, there may be a, a good rationale for five, given the broad basis of legislation and human rights legislation we're looking at, both across these islands and on an international stage. So uh, it, is, it is a very broad based uh, field, and, and you may require a, a number of experts to look at that. So uh, I, I wouldn't be as dismissive of. The number, uh, uh, but look, will by writing this letter does it delay the work of the committee? Can the committee continue with its work? Yes. Uh, yes. Moving forward. Yes, I think I think we can continue Make. with the work, John. And of course, Make. It's up to the Make. excuse me. So the question that he's asked is if we can continue with our work. One of the, the matters raising that we have here is how we're going to deal with the panel of experts, how, we're, how often we're going to hear from them, and whether we want a joint report or whether we want them all to report individually. If we're going to write a letter which potentially will then delay the process of selecting those experts, surely that will delay our work. If I see no reason why it should. If it, if it delay, if we if we write to the executive office, expressing a view, questioning whether five is necessary. What, what's but they're the, they're currently in the process. They're in the selection process. Where, where are they in the process, Jim? Well, it was supposed to be done by now, and we were told that it was now going to be the start of July. The end of this month, the start of July. So if we write them a letter now, surely that will delay that. I don't. I don't see if, if they reach agreement that, uh, for example, three would be a better number. I don't see that would delay the appointment of three. The process remains the same. The outcome changes. 
I, I would have concerns that it will. Um, if you want to propose your motion to write a letter, we can take a vote. Sure, I propose. Second that. Okay. I'm content to support a letter of concern. Well, I obviously want it minuted that I'm not. I don't know what John wants to do. I, 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 I don't see the need for it at this stage. So, we'll, we'll show hands for that. So we have three. And against them we have two. So what do we do? Right. It's correct. Right. So yeah. What do we do then in that instance? Are you so gonna... we'll write the letter to the executive office. Okay. So that means then that in terms of us deciding if we have a view on how we're going to hear from the panel. Do people have a view then? We can't, we can't really proceed with that. In this instance. Uh, Chair, I think, first of all, I thank the clerk for the, for the options paper. From, from my perspective, you know, the, the big question is do we hear from them collectively or individually or a mixture of both? Um, I, I can't answer that until I know who they are and what their areas of expertise are. Okay. I can't help thinking with your David Fairclough, if you know that analogy. No. <laughs> he was a super sub for Liverpool Football Club. Years oh, ago. Right, right, right. Very effective. <laughs> Do other members have a view on how they would like to hear from the panel? Again, I think it maybe wait until they're appointed and then we'll have a better sense of what we need and also looking at our own, alongside our own work programme, what fits best. Okay, so the Executive Office have written to us expressing that they, they want some guidance from how we want to interact with the panel. Is that... Uh, more in sort of verbal conversations, we've so the committee has written to the executive office to seek the clarification around remuneration, um, in in line with the last meeting, what members had said. So we're still waiting for a response on that. Um, so rising from that vote, then we'll send uh, a further letter. Um, Just in terms, though, of the questions that you had put in this section of our of our um, pack in terms of how we're going to hear from the panel and what way we're going to have a report at the end of that. That was a request from the Executive Office. Just in, in conversation, say that they would appreciate some, some clarity, Games. but they haven't written formally to say so. Okay, so can we then go back to them to say that we need to wait until the panel is selected? It, it could be included in the, the letter if members wish, Chair. I'm easy on that particular point. Chair, I, I would be happy, uh, the clerk's happy that the options paper is forwarded with a cover note to say that the, the options will be considered when we hear the names and the expertise. Uh, sure. Yes, John. Uh, again, apologies, I'm just refreshing or trying to catch up on the work of the committee. Has the executive office formally asked the committee to give an opinion on how they hear from the, the group of experts? Not formally. They've well, asked well, then we're on the communication that hasn't been asked. So I, I think it's a, it's a void point in the sense of uh, um, why, why answer a question that hasn't been asked? Yep. Uh, we, we can return to it uh, when the panel is appointed and how we engage with them or, or seek further clarification from the executive office. But to write back and say uh, one way or the other to a question that hasn't been asked may seem a bit strange from the executive office. Yeah, they've, they've asked the clerk this in conversation, John. So that was why well, the clerk had asked with respect, respect, with respect uh, to the clerk and to the committee, that's not how business is done. Um, if the executive office are seeking uh, a direction or guidance from a committee, <clears throat> that's done in work. That's fine. So we're going to proceed as, as follows. You're going to send a letter? 
Okay. So we don't need to we don't need to deal with that part of the matters. So the next item is the correspondence. This is on page 16 of your packs. We've received guidance from the Chairperson's Liaison Group for the Assembly Committees during the public health crisis. This takes account of the Assembly's own video conferencing facilities, Starleaf, which can be used by members and witnesses and which is fully integrated within Assembly Broadcasting. We've also received a written submission from Dr Amanda Cahill-Ripley, Senior Lecturer in Law at the School of Law and Social Justice, University of Liverpool, on human rights and peace building. We'll hear from Amanda in September. Our members content to note that the correspondence is set out. Now we have a presentation, briefing on human rights in Wales by Professor Simon Hoffman. We'll move on to agenda, agenda item six. Um, Simon Hoffman is a professor of law at the Hillary Rodham Clinton School of Law in Swansea University. The clerk's memo, together with Simon's written submission, can be found from page 32 of your meeting papers. Also included in your meeting papers are the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the UN Principles for Older Persons, and the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And I'd like to welcome Professor Simon to the meeting. Hello. Hello, Matt. Hello. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How is everyone? Brilliant. If you want to, to begin. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit thrown because um, I thought I was coming to answer questions rather than give a presentation. So I haven't prepared anything uh, for a presentation. But if I were going to present on the situation in Wales, it would basically be um, as per the written submission that I put in for the committee. Um, I think people are generally aware that Wales has taken uh, what I would describe um, as a progressive approach toward children's rights almost since the outset of devolution. Uh, and there are some reasons for that. I think the makeup of the uh, First Assembly uh, was influential. There were a lot of people who came to the First Assembly from civil society, but also from the child rights sector. Uh, I think the commitment of the First Minister, Rodri Morgan, um, not the first first minister, but uh, when he became first minister, his commitment to children's rights certainly added impetus to the agenda. And I think the the, the scheme, the framework of uh, devolution um, really had some impact on framing the way that assembly members uh, approached their uh, responsibilities as lawmakers in Wales. Um, and. By that, I mean that there was a great deal of emphasis on policy initially because the uh, scope of powers of the Assembly were rather limited. And a lot of the policy powers that the uh, Assembly were given were uh, in relation to matters that directly affected children, so things like social care, health, education. So uh, it's entirely, um, or it might have been entirely predictable that the Assembly took the course uh, that it did take. Um, there was uh, very early on, as I say, a commitment to children's rights, and that initially manifested itself through policy and policy statements. Uh, but then later, uh, in 2009, the Assembly committed to incorporate the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child into Welsh law. It took a little while to get there after that commitment was made, uh, but in 2011, the Assembly passed into law the Rights of Children and Young Persons uh, Wales Measure 2011. Uh, in short, that measure requires um, the Welsh ministers collectively to have due regard to the UNCRC, uh, part one of the UNCRC and its first and second optional protocols uh, when exercising any of their functions. And that measure, uh, which is primary uh, legislation in application to Wales, um, Legislation in Wales is no longer called a measure. We now call them statutes or laws, but at the time we used the term measure. Uh, the measure is primary legislation, uh, which is binding on the Welsh ministers. Um, in terms of how effective the due regard duty has been, I have actually carried out some research together with a colleague from uh, Children in Wales uh, for the Equalities and Human Rights Commission in Wales. Uh, which uh, came, uh, came to the conclusion that the measure had had a great deal of um, positive impact uh, in Wales. Uh, I think to understand the impact of the measure, one has to understand its purpose. Its purpose was not to uh, 
um, establish a regime where children would be able to claim a remedy for breach or violation of their rights. Rather, it, it uh, established a due regard duty in order to require ministers uh, to pay close attention to children's rights um, in everything that they do so that a culture of children's rights became embedded within the Welsh Government. And the purpose of this was really to uh, address what was a perceived implementation gap between the rhetoric of children's rights that had been there from the outside, outside of the first assembly um, and the actual lived experience of children. Uh, and in that context, I think the measure has been uh, I think it's fair to say, based on my research, that the measure has been uh, a great success. Um, it has raised the visibility of children's rights and policy making within the Welsh Government. It has established or led to the establishment of a number of mechanisms which are beneficial to children's rights in policy making, such as uh, child rights impact assessment, which is recommended by the Committee on the Rights of the Child as a general measure of implementation of the Convention. And it has provided leverage for civil society in particular, and especially the Children's Commission in Wales, uh, to undertake policy advocacy more strongly uh, on the basis of the due regard duty. Uh, so overall, I think the, the measure has been a very progressive step in Wales. Um, and if you don't mind, I, I'll pause there for a moment and, and take questions. Thank you very much, um, Professor, and I know that members have all had access to your submission. Um, in terms of questions, and, and I'll start, um, if you don't mind. So I thought it was quite interesting. Obviously, in the North, we have a particular set of circumstances. And one of the, the conversations that we had with um, the, the, during the briefing that we had at the last meeting was around what we have... Uh, autonomy over it as a devolved matter and then what's reserved to Westminster and I suppose it's interesting in your submission how the Welsh Assembly probably you could say had their hands tied a little to, to the same extent in that a lot of this is, is reserved to, to Westminster and they sort of got around that um, by what they did have sort of oversight of in terms of, of children's rights and I just wondered if you could touch on, on that and, and how that experience potentially could could uh, work for us here? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think it's important to recognise that the, uh, the process started in Wales with a strong commitment to children's rights. Uh, and that very much led to um, an innovative approach to the exercise of um, devolved competencies. I, I think if we were uh, in the present day in the same position, it will be a lot more straightforward as to what the uh, National Assembly for Wales could and couldn't do uh, in terms of uh, incorporation of the UNCRC. Uh, but at the time, I think the, the Assembly um, was looking for different ways to, to, if you like, flex its legislative muscles. Uh, and to some extent, I think that the, the way that devolution has evolved in Wales from a very constrained model of devolution to now the model that we have where we have the reserved model of devolution has been actually quite beneficial in Wales because it's required the Assembly to look creatively at the way it does things and to examine much more closely than might have otherwise been the case what it wants to do and how it's going to do it. Uh, and the due regard duty, um, although there are uh, definitely benefits to it in terms of um, how it establishes a proactive approach to children's rights. There were clearly other benefits to it as well in terms of how it fitted with the devolved settlement at the time. Uh, and um, I think interestingly uh, what that led to as well was, was a degree I think of, um, I don't want to put it too strongly, uh, I wouldn't say confrontation between ministers and their officials, but a certain amount of friction between uh, ministers and their officials because ministers wanted to get on and do something. And oh, we've got a technical difficulty. Is that we're back? Oh, we're back in public session. We had to adjourn there due to a technical difficulty. Um, Simon, apologies. You were answering my question, and I. I got a bit of it, but you were still talking and we had already broken off. If you... Right. Um, I'm not how far, I'm sure how far we got to. Um, I think just to... Go on. 
no, no, tear away. You were just. I, I think, just to summarize what I was saying, I, I think the limited scheme of devolution uh, at the time when it was proposed to introduce legislation to incorporate the UNCRC led to a good deal of creativity um, in terms of what could be done and um, the form of the legislation that was introduced. Uh, but I think what is what's key, what was key to it all was the determination of ministers to push the, the measure through. Uh, so it was about creatively looking at what powers there were available to the Assembly at the time to legislate in, in uh, the area of children's rights. Thank you. And I suppose that, I mean, follows on from even what we were talking about at the start of the meeting for ourselves, if, if you know, we have a commitment to agree in a Bill of Rights. So it, it's down to what I suppose members are are willing to do and you, you use the facilities available to you. Mike, I'll pass on to you, Vice Chair. Chair, thank you very much indeed. And oh. Simon, first of all, thank you very much for your paper and, and also for being so generous of your time uh, with us today. I, I think my, my area of interest is what happens when we codify rights in terms of the balance between politicians making decisions and the judiciary uh, making decisions. So in terms of your right of children and young persons Wales measure, uh, which is on page 36 of the PAC's members, you say at paragraph 18, the measure requires Welsh ministers, when exercising their functions, to have due regard to part one of the UNCRC. How do you measure due regard? Um, well, it's the, the, the standard itself was borrowed, actually, from uh, equalities legislation. So uh, what is now the Equalities Act 2010. So the formulation uh, has been used in relation to... Um, obligations arising in relation to equality for, for quite some time. So we were, I mean, that was one of the, the rationale of using the due regard duty is because it tapped into uh, established case law on what due regard actually means. Um, and it's very much about having in place proper processes to ensure that uh, the the uh, rights which are set out in part one of um, the UNCRC and the two optional protocols are properly taken into account by ministers when they're making their decisions. Uh, and what, what it in effect means uh, in, is that the rights are to be taken in account in, in, in substance. So it's supposed to be um, a meaningful and a, a reflective process, not just a tick box exercise. And one of the things that we put in place in Wales to ensure that that takes place is a child rights impact assessment where ministers outline the, the process which they go through in order to arrive at a decision in relation to children's rights, uh, including the evidence that they take into account, the rights that they take into account and how they've consulted with children and young people. Uh, and that, um, that document, a child rights impact assessment, which is in the form of a template, which ministers, actually their officials complete as part of the policy or legislative process, uh, is put into the public domain. So it increases transparency and accountability uh, for children's rights. Is that helpful? Yes, yes, it is. It is. And just as a follow up and, and to be clear, you're basically saying due regard is defined by case law in other words, ultimately, it is, the, it is the law and not the politician uh, who, who makes that distinction. No, um, do you regard, I'm not saying that, do you regard is a process on which the courts have given guidance as to what politicians, what steps politicians might take uh, in order to take into account whatever they're meant to take into account, whether that be equality objectives or, in our case, children's rights, but the courts are quite clear uh, that they're simply giving guidance as to what they would anticipate the process would involve. The process itself is entirely down to, to the decision maker, the politicians in the case of children's rights. So, for example, in relation to impact assessment, the courts have said that while impact assessment might help to establish that due regard to a particular objective has been had, it's not an absolute requirement. So in Wales, we've taken that and we said, well, we'd like to see child rights impact assessment because we think it's a useful tool, not only for establishing 
that uh, regard has been due regard has been had to children's rights, but also for managing the process. So, as part of the child rights impact assessment, uh, there will be an expectation that some form of consultation takes place with children uh, over a, a, a particular policy or legislative proposal. So it's, it's not uh, it's not the case that the courts are setting the procedure. They're simply advising on what form they think the procedure might take in order to have due regard. Okay. Uh, previously, our programme for governments, um, our programmes for government might, might be said to have been based on intent, that, that we were going to do things because we thought we would achieve things. The, the current one, when, when we sign it off, will be outcomes-based uh, approach. So we'll actually be measuring, as you say, the, the, the impact. Have you got an outcomes-based approach in, in Wales? Um, the Welsh Government is uh, concerned with, with outcomes in relation to uh, different policy objectives, but when it comes to the way that the, uh, the, the children's rights have been incorporated, um, it, it, the, the measure itself doesn't, this may sound a little odd, but doesn't actually focus on outcomes. It focuses on the culture that gives rise to outcomes. So that the measure was always intended to influence the decision-making culture. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's an assumption of the measure that if you get the culture right, if you get children's rights embedded in policy-making and decision-making processes, then ultimately you will end up with better outcomes for children. Uh, I did some, as I mentioned previously, I did some work for the Equalities and Human Rights Commission with children in Wales looking at the impact of the measure. And we were very clear at the outset that we weren't going to be looking at impact in terms of actual outcomes for children. Uh, one of the problems there is that the measure wasn't, in, as I said, the measure wasn't intended to influence outcomes. It was intended to influence the culture of, of policy making. But also it's extremely difficult that this was recognized not only in our research, but in other research to disaggregate the causative factors that might influence outcomes for children. So we, we I personally haven't done any work on uh, the measure and outcomes, uh, but the intent of the measure is to influence outcomes indirectly by improving the policy making culture. But going back to your original question, the Welsh Government certainly did, does have outcomes frameworks in relation to its, its policies. Great. Simon, thank you very much indeed. And again, thank you for your time. I'll go around members around the room. Paula, thank you. We... Uh, thank you, Simon, and I would echo um, Mike's comments there about your patience and, and attendance today. It's very much appreciated. Um, first of all, um, I just wanted to talk about uh, sort of advocacy of, for young people, certainly in terms of how they find their voice in our process of feeding in um, and then moving forward. You talked about their seeking a remedy through the court and stuff, and I suppose in many ways we want to be avoiding that so that the policy decisions are right. So it's really about how we keep young people engaged in that, and is that through the education system, or you know, how, how would you get them involved and keep young people involved? First question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think there are um, a number of uh, consequences of the measure which have um, increased the potential for young people, uh, children and young people, to get involved in policy decision making. One I've already mentioned, which is children's rights impact assessment, which is a mechanism um, recommended by the committee and, and incorporated uh, into Welsh policy decision making via the children's scheme. And the children's scheme is established by the measure itself. Uh, and one of the uh, expectations of a child rights impact assessment is that the views of children will be sought, uh, and not only sought, but listened to uh, when policy decision making is made. The measure actually itself uh, contains a freestanding provision which mirrors Article 42 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, which is an obligation on ministers, in effect, to raise awareness of uh, the due regard duty in children's rights in Wales. Uh, and the, the Welsh Government does, in fact, um, support quite a lot of um, projects which are intended to raise awareness of uh, rights amongst children and young people. Uh, and I mentioned that in the research that I carried out with Children in Wales for the Equalities and Human Rights uh, Commission. So I think it, it is important to, uh, obviously, to engage with children as part of the policy-making process. And there are... 
uh, opportunities, I think, through uh, legislative means to uh, embed within legislative processes and policy making processes uh, duties and obligations to consult with children. I will say this, uh, in relation to Wales, our experience is that, that our legislation probably doesn't go far enough in requiring that. Um, the, uh, the children's scheme which I mentioned is a scheme which is required by the legislation, but a child rights impact assessment is part of the scheme, so it's not actually a statutory requirement in itself. Uh, and the expectation within the child rights impact assessment that children should be consulted as part of policy making uh, is ancillary to a child rights impact assessment. So again, it's one step removed from being a statutory obligation. My personal feeling is, uh, and I, I, I primarily focus my work on how to translate international obligations into law and policy at a local level, uh, and in my case, a devolved Wales level, my personal view is that we should pay more attention uh, to incorporating obligations such as a requirement to consult with children in policy making processes as legal requirements as opposed to leaving it to the discretion uh, of politicians or their officials. Okay, and just a supplementary to that, thank you for that. Um, it, it really would relate then to those children who maybe have learning disabilities, um, delayed development, maybe non-verbal um, autism, and it's really about how then we provide a mechanism for them, but also then maybe their parents or carers or, um, you know, say, or like their teachers. I'm just wondering how we actually give them a voice that is actually meaningful, because uh, sometimes a lot of this is tick boxing. Yeah. I'm, I'm not actually an expert on children's participation, so I wouldn't wish to go into that, um, into that field in any detail. Uh, my view is that, that what legislation needs to do is to provide the framework, so to, to, to introduce the requirement that, um, that public policy making takes account of the views of children. Uh, I think there are, there are lots of people out there, there are, there are experts out there, uh, and, and I know of one in particular uh, in Queen's University, uh, Professor Laura Lundy, uh, who is, is an expert in child participation, and I think it's probably more for them to comment on how you actually achieve participation of different groups of children. Uh, I wouldn't suggest in any way that legislation should, um, should specify mechanisms for participation. I think what legislation can do is specify that participation is required. It, it, it then is down to different areas of expertise to determine how that participation should take place. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Paula. Michelle, do you have yes, questions? Please, thank you, and thank you very much for, for your time. And I find your paper really very interesting. And it's interesting that in Northern Ireland in 2015, we passed the Children's Services Corporation Act. Um, and again, that just requires um, cooperation among certain public bodies and authorities and other persons in order to contribute to the well-being of, of children and young persons. And indeed, um, in determining the meaning of well-being for the purposes of that act, actually, regard is to be had to the provisions of the UNCRC. So I suppose there's some sort of synergies in relation to that, which I find interesting. In our next presentation, um, some of the recommendations that are coming through from Scotland from the advisory group, where initially they'll be looking at a duty to um, pay due regard. There'll be a sunset clause, which would then move to result in a duty to comply. Was there any consideration given to that at, at the time of the drafting? Uh, at the time of the drafting of the, the, the Welsh measure, there was some consideration given to uh, different mechanisms, including the potential for um, what's referred to as full and direct incorporation of the Convention. Um, however, at the time it was felt that there were obstacles, uh, not only in relation to the competencies of the Assembly, but also the few judicial system in England and Wales. Uh, which would have made such an approach impractical. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm also a member of um, the Children's Commissioner, uh, Children and Young People's Commissioner in Scotland Advisory Group on Incorporation of the UNCRC in Scotland. Uh, and the work that we've done there uh, suggests that the approach that, that, that might work best is to have uh, a due regard approach married to a full and direct incorporation approach so that you have the proactive element which the due regard duty brings in order to embed a culture of uh, children's rights thinking early on in policy development, allied to the potential for uh, 
um, for children who, who despite uh, the, 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 the proactive thinking about their rights, for, for some reason they fall through the net and find that their rights are being violated to give those children the opportunity to, to claim a remedy before the courts. Uh, but it, it seems to me, and the more I, I study this and the more I work on it, and I've been working on it for now for, for over a decade, uh, the more I, 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 I work on it, I realise that it's not a case of, you know, one approach is going to work. I think you need to think creatively and think, right, what do we want to do? Do we want to instill a culture of thinking about children's rights in order to avoid the possibility that children will need a remedy at a later date? Well, yes, of course, we want that. But then you have to face the reality that that's not always going to work, so children should be provided with a remedy. So we need some form of legislation that also provides for that. Uh, and that's certainly the approach that the um, advisory group uh, advising the Children and Persons Commission in Scotland uh, has taken. Thank you. Thank you. Is that you? John, are you still on? It's not on my screen. John, have you got questions? Yes, uh, and you can hear me okay? We can. I can. Yeah, okay, thank you. And, and thank you, Professor, for your presentation thus far. Um, I, I'm drawn to paragraph 14 in, in your written presentation, uh, which refers to the Welsh Government as saying that it's intended to go further on the incorporation of human rights because they are concerned about the agenda uh, of, of the current Westminster Government. Uh, can you elaborate on that any further? Yeah, I, obviously I wouldn't want to speak for, for, the, for the Welsh Government, but I'm currently doing a, a piece of work which was commissioned by the Welsh Government uh, in looking at advancing and strengthening uh, human rights in Wales through the exercise of devolved competencies. Uh, and the, um, the document which actually set out the, the brief for that piece of work referred to um, the, 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 the uh, impact of Brexit and also uh, concerns about um, the continuation of uh, the UK's membership of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. So uh, there obviously there are some concerns in Wales that um, possibly the UK government is uh, not uh, as supportive of human rights as, as we are in Wales. Uh, and therefore the Welsh government is keen, I think, this is the impression I get, the key, Welsh government is keen to do whatever it can uh, to secure a framework for equality and human rights in Wales, independent uh, of whatever the uh, UK government may be planning for human rights in due course. Okay, um, uh, that, that's interesting in itself, because I would see uh, a, 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 certainly a devolution of, of human rights legislation uh, across the islands in the sense that Welsh, Wales could go in one direction Scotland another direction on ourselves either stay stagnant or go uh, in another direction. Um, can I just, in terms of legislation is one thing, having a, a Bill of Rights or a children's rights legislation as you've referred to in Wales, or even our own equality legislation here, having those rights is one thing, but enforcing them is another. In terms of the Welsh experience around the children's rights agenda, have citizens access to the mechanisms which does hold government to account? Have they the ability uh, and the financial backing to hold government to account? Um, that's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a very good question, if you don't mind me saying so, but a very complicated one to answer, uh, particularly in the context of Wales, because. Uh, the due regard duty does not give children the, the right to seek a, an individual remedy where their rights are violated. It's, it's a public law remedy, uh, and judicial review is the remedy that they would need to seek, and, and that is notoriously difficult um, as a remedy to access, both in terms of procedure uh, and, and costs. Uh, I can tell you that there's not been a single judicial review uh, since the measure was introduced. Now, that not, ought not to be taken as a signal that it's difficult, that the, the, the difficulties I've spoken to have acted as some sort of barrier, although I'm sure in some cases it has. It's just that the accountability mechanisms that um, accompany the measure are different. So they're more political um, and they're more administrative rather than 
public law remedy. So you have accountability, for example, via the Children's Commissioner, who will be able to use a due regard duty to question ministers as to whether or not they have um, had proper regard to children's rights. Um, in Wales, part of the research that I'm currently undertaking uh, on advancing and strengthening equality and human rights is to reflect on whether we need to go further than that and give individuals a claim right, if you like, a right to bring an action where their, um, their rights are violated. When the measure was initially being thought about and it was thought whether or not we should have that sort of uh, approach to children's rights, one of the issues that was taken into account was the fact that children face particular barriers to accessing justice. Uh, and I think that if Wales does go along the lines of we want to incorporate more rights and we want to give more direct remedies, then very serious consideration would have to be given to how you support that through, for example, public legal education to raise awareness of rights, but also support for community law centres, for example, uh, in order to access people to justice. Because otherwise, I think as you're probably hinting at, John, um, you may have the right, but it, it comes for nothing because you cannot enforce it. You don't have the means, you don't have the support. In fact, you don't have the knowledge to be able to, to, to take action on your rights. So I think it's not just a case of let's give them people a right where they can take that right forward in court if they wish. It's actually giving them the means to act on that desire uh, if they need to. Uh, and finally, Chair, can I just ask one quick follow-up question to that? In, in terms of, of, of the public accountability factor of that, how receptive are government departments to representations from, say, the Children's Commissioner in Wales? Um, d d does that work? It, uh, it does. I think I can say quite categorically it does. Uh, I think we've seen examples, of it, perhaps the best example being Brexit. Um, when when ministers were first thinking about their response to Brexit, um, they perhaps didn't give enough attention to children's rights uh, as they needed to. Representations were made by the child rights community uh, and, and the tone and the content of policy changed fairly quickly. Uh, and I think in other areas where children's rights impact assessment has been used, um, there's evidence in my research for the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, that via the consultation processes, um, it's certainly the case that, that ministers are receptive uh, to representations, not only from the Children's Commissioner, but from the Children and Persons Education Committee, uh, which is a scrutiny committee of the Assembly, from individual Assembly members, and also from uh, civil society. And actually, you're seeing quite a lot of that now with the whole response to COVID-19 as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, Welcome. John. All right. Uh, Professor Hoffman, he's still there. Um, I, just, I just want to, to thank you for your time and apologise for, for the delay today and the, and the amount of, of time that you spent waiting on us. So thank you very much and I appreciate your contribution and we'll let you hang up now. You're very welcome and uh, thank you for inviting me and I hope all goes well for you. No bother. Thank you. Good man, thank you. So we now have um, waiting in the wings uh, item six, uh, a briefing on the human rights in Scotland by Professor Tobias Locke. Um, the briefing from Professor Locke uh, from Maynooth University. There's a clerk's memo together with Tobias's written submission, uh, which can be found at pages 102 to 117 of your pack. Uh, we've also included in your meeting papers the Scottish First Minister's advisory group on human rights leadership final report. And Tobias was part of this advisory group, and I'd like to welcome him to the meeting. And Professor, uh, thank you very much um, for for joining us today. And apologies for the for the wait that you've had, and we've had some technical difficulties. But if you want to start uh, with your presentation, proceed. Yes. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for um, having me. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly through my uh, written submission and highlight the things that I think are probably uh, most of interest to you, and, and then I'll be happy to take any questions. I should say first that these are my personal views. I'm not representing the Scottish uh, Government, First Minister, or indeed the advisory group. So this is my personal reading of the report and of our work at the time. So in 2018, the First Minister asked me and uh, nine others to become part of an advisory group on human rights leadership. And I think the context was very much uh, Brexit. 
there was a uh, concern uh, that uh, the um, removal of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU would lead to a reduction in human rights uh, protection in Scotland. And therefore, the, our brief was to make sure or to find ways in which this could be counteracted at the devolved level, at the Scottish level. Um, so we had three guiding principles. One was non-regression uh, as compared with the status quo. Uh, the second was uh, to enable Scotland to keep pace with uh, developments at the EU level. And the third was uh, to enable Scotland to provide leadership in human rights. So um, obviously we were operating in a devolved uh, constitutional environment, so that was uh, tricky. Uh, and that explains some of the uh, recommendations and, 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 and the focus of the recommendations. Uh, and, and I'll try to explain that briefly. Obviously, we uh, very similar, obviously, the, the Scottish uh, devolution settlement to the Northern Irish one. Uh, we have the, hate, the Human Rights Act as one of the pillars of, of human rights uh, protection, uh, which is uh, guaranteed uh, by way of Westminster legislation and which uh, the Scottish uh, Parliament cannot uh, 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 violate. Um, equally, the Scottish Parliament has no power to modify the Human Rights Act. So, uh, and this was part of the reasoning why we more or less left civil and political rights as guaranteed in the European Convention on Human Rights and as guaranteed by the Human Rights Act uh, alone. So we decided not to do anything there, even though the Human Rights Act and, and its provisions are not perfect uh, in, in, in any uh, risk. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination, there could be uh, something done, but we, we, we left that untouched. We also left employment rights untouched because, again, it's, it's a reserved matter, so we didn't want to go there. Uh, same with equality rights uh, for Scotland, uh, at least a reserved matter, so uh, nothing uh, we could do. So the focus was very much on improving and, and uh, incorporating uh, social economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. And that was the focus of it all um, and of our work. And um, uh, in terms of background, uh, the, the UK is obviously signed up to a number of international treaties like the uh, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, but also the European Social Charter, at least the original one from the 1960s, uh, and has is therefore uh, internationally obliged to comply with these rights. So one of the uh, motivators was to make this uh, real and uh, make these rights real at the, at the uh, domestic uh, devolved level. Now, in terms of uh, the, our, our process, there was obviously the advisory group, which consisted of 10 members, uh, mainly academics, but also uh, representatives from the Scottish Human Rights Commission and uh, legal practitioners. Um, and the advisory group, was, and it was in its terms of reference, very much concerned with having some real life input as well. Uh, it's not just the ivory tower uh, 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 drawing up uh, 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 recommendations, but that uh, we would have, would be grounded in, in real life. So we had the reference group, which consisted of uh, members of uh, civil society organizations that would uh, we would meet uh, a couple of times during the process. It was a one year process. And there were a host of individual meetings with um, various experts from the judiciary, uh, other uh, uh, constitutional lawyers, and so on and so on, in order to simply inform our views. Now, there were three three issues, and I think that goes back to what uh, Simon Hoffman uh, was talking about um, in terms of cooperation, incorporation. Um, three guiding methods was first is structure, the second is process, and the third is outcome. And what that means is that we realize that it, it's not enough to simply put um, rights into a statute and, and then leave it at that, but there has to be a process of making these rights real and making them applicable uh, in Scotland and then to ensure an outcome that would ensure that uh, these rights are, are become real. So that, that's the, the, the three steps and you can see that throughout the document uh, that, that they're being referred to. Now, as for recommendations, uh, the, the main recommendation is really to, for the Scottish Parliament to enact an act of the Scottish Parliament, which would obviously only be binding on Scottish public authorities, um, implementing core economic, social and cultural rights. So 
it would be a right to housing, a right to healthcare, a right or access to healthcare, a right to uh, education, and so on and so on, uh, and a right to a healthy environment. Um, now, again, this would only satisfy the kind of structural part. Uh, so, in terms of process. A really important aspect of the recommendations is that the act should be supplemented by uh, schedules that would spell out what these rights actually mean. Because when you're talking about uh, social rights in particular, um, they require quite a lot of positive action on part of the state. And that positive action on part of the state, well, how is the state supposed to know what it is supposed to be doing? Uh, how are civil servants, how are lawmakers supposed to know what they're supposed to be doing? That should be spelled out in these schedules to the act, which would again be reflective of international law um, practice and international law recommendations. Um, the, another endeavor was to keep judicial review or the judicial review ability to a minimum. Um, the group decided that there should be uh, uh, the ultimate remedy of judicial review um, and uh, uh, enforceability in the courts, uh, but First of all, that, that should only come in after uh, about five years. So uh, the, the, uh, there would be a sunrise clause as um, had previously been mentioned where the duty to comply with these rights would only come in after a couple of years. And in the intermediate term, there would only be a duty to pay due regard. Um, but even then, when the duty to comply uh, is, 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 um, has been triggered, uh, judicial review should be kept uh, as a last resort only. So there would be uh, other measures that would beef up uh, the protection of rights. So we'd have a pre-legislative scrutiny. Um, we would have um, uh, a commitment to capacity building that is in particular training on part of local authorities, uh, civil servants uh, at, the, at the Scottish government level, but also of, of civil society more generally, uh, rights awareness training, so to speak that people would actually know what they are entitled to on the one hand, and on the other hand, what people would know what they are supposed to deliver. Um, there would also have to be uh, novel remedies, perhaps for the courts, so that a court would not just strike down a measure, but uh, could apply uh, somewhat uh, more uh, creative remedies um, that uh, would say, give a local authority a couple of years to implement certain um, measures in order to ensure that the right to uh, access a, a decent uh, housing is um, is complied with. That is something that can't be done overnight. Uh, and there would also uh, have to be a, a, a duty to in, uh, incorporate um, those uh, uh, rights commitments in the national uh, performance framework for, for Scotland. So again, it would lead to some a type of a sort of mainstreaming of, of these rights commitments in policy making in Scotland. Now, the final thing I'd like to say where we are now, I mean, these recommendations were handed uh, uh, over to the First Minister at the end of 2018. And I believe as of a couple of months ago, um, a new group was formed, uh, um, which is now led by a cabinet minister. Uh, and um, this new group uh, on a national called a national task force on human rights leadership uh, is going to work on the basis of these recommendations and try to make them real uh, and, and as a next step then there would be uh, the Scottish Parliament get, getting into action uh, and adopting uh, legislation in the new term so after the elections in 2021 so that would be the, the rough timeline now obviously who knows what's going to happen in the election so it might not uh, happen at all but you know if 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 the uh, current first minister is uh, still in office uh, in, in, in about a year's time, uh, this process is probably going to continue. Thank you very much, um, Professor Locke. Um, so I, I'll, I'll open up um, with the first question. So this probably links into what I was asking Simon about as well. So in your paper, um, you refer, and I'll expose some of my, some of my own ignorance here around the, the Scottish uh, devolution system. Obviously, you refer there to the fact that human rights in Scotland are not a reserved matter, and that's one of the conversations that we've had here in the North as to what exactly is reserved, what exactly is devolved, where the wriggle room is. But that's uh, the, the Human Rights Act sort of is outstanding of that. 
Um, I just wondered if you would talk uh, about the specifics of that and how that played out then in your advisory group. Yeah, um, so under the Scotland Act 1998, the, uh, if you look at what is reserved, um, we don't have to, dis uh, Scotland doesn't have the distinction between accepted and reserved matters, there's only reserved and devolved. So if you look at what is reserved, um, you will not find human rights there as a, uh, a reserved matter. But what you will find is that the Human Rights Act 1998 is, uh, um, is, a protected, uh, is a protected statute, so it's protected from modification by the Scottish Parliament. Um, so that means that, you know, if, if, uh, that human rights as such uh, can be legislated on. Obviously, the reach of that legislation can only concern Scottish, local, uh, Scottish authorities, Scottish public bodies. Uh, obviously, the Scottish Parliament has no power to legislate uh, and, and bind and tie the hands, say, of the Westminster government. Um, and, and that was basically the basis of our, uh, uh, um, of our work. Now, there is a, say, a, an area where we weren't, we might have been uh, certain, uh, some of us might have been certain about it, but we weren't 100% uh, uh, agreed, perhaps. Uh, and, and certainly not 100% agreed that we should, uh, that Scotland should be taking the risk of legislating in an area that would overlap with the Human Rights Act. Uh, some in the group would have argued that that is perfectly fine. I mean, for instance, there are certain gaps in the Human Rights Act when it comes to the right to a fair trial. The right to a fair trial under the European Convention on Human Rights is only protected in criminal and civil matters, but not in um, um, purely administrative uh, uh, proceedings. So that would be a gap that might, one might want to close, but uh, we decided it was best not to go there at the time. So just follow, like, I know like a specific, you're mentioning a gap there. So some of the language in the act, even around like the definition of marriage, a lot of the, the parliaments have went, you know, farther or have progressed on from what's um, contained in, in the act. But what you're saying is that while some would have felt that you could have went further, it, that that wasn't the the route that was taken. I think the um, well, I mean, no, you know, I'm, 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 this is my personal view now, and this is certainly not something that you will find in the report there or anything. But um, I think we were under quite a lot of time pressure, so uh, we had about we had less than twelve months to come up with this report. So the, I think the a, a view was taken that we should focus our energy on advancing economic, social, cultural rights, environmental rights, and, uh, and not go down the route of trying to improve civil and political rights. And I think that is something I, I tried to say in my written evidence to your committee now, that that is something you might want to uh, look at as well. You, you've mentioned the right to marry uh, uh, in, the, in the European Convention uh, as it's uh, conventionally understood is, is limited to men and women, that is a, say, a different sex uh, marriage. And obviously, if you look at, uh, for instance, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU, you will see that uh, that uh, limitation is not there. It is more openly formulated. Uh, so it is open to protecting a same-sex uh, marriage as well. So that is maybe something uh, you, you might want to look at in terms of updating rights. I mean, the, the, the Convention of, on Human Rights was drafted in 1950, and it is, or in the early 1950s, and it is uh, reflected in the language uh, there, and it might no longer quite uh, uh, reflect the, 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 what we would be doing now if we would, wanted to uh, draw it up from scratch. Thank you, um, Tobias. And just my last question, and then I'll open it up to other members. Um, obviously, this, and you, you've laid it out quite clearly in your paper, that this was prompted by Brexit, and, and that was the sort of the motivating factor, and you had quite a quick turnaround there. And obviously, it's, I suppose it's, it's timely. For us to, to consider, and I mean, as part of even the agreement uh, and, and this committee, um, this formulation, what our particular circumstances are and how they're influenced by Brexit. And I suppose that's something that, that we have to think about here um, and what the impact of, of Brexit would be, if, if you could speak to that. Well, it's... Um, it's 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 a, no, it's, a, it's a that's a difficult question. <laughs> now the impact of Brexit is that um, the Charter of Fundamental Rights will, as of first of January twenty twenty one, no longer apply in the same way, or will no longer apply directly uh, 
uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, now, obviously, the Charter of Fundamental Rights only applies where EU law is being implemented or dealt with in some shape or form. So uh, it doesn't apply to pure in purely domestic situations. That's an important thing to note. So the Charter is not a it's 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 not a panacea. It's not it's not it's not a super remedy that is suddenly uh, disappearing from the landscape. But it does. Uh, so, so it, but the Charter of Fundamental Rights protects more rights than the Human Rights Act, and it protects them in a stronger way because EU law, in 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 uh, translated into a UK context, it has uh, uh, provides stronger remedies than uh, the Human Rights Act does, because it can also protect against Westminster legislation, basically, which the Human Rights Act can't do. Um, that is, that is the main thing. Now, the, the, the Charter contains certain economic and social rights. Um, it doesn't always protect them very strongly, or uh, at least we don't know exactly in what, what, what the strength of protection is. There are certain rights that are only protected as so-called principles, which are similar to maybe policy goals, something maybe in, in, in some respects almost similar to a duty to pay due regard, in some shape or form in the policy making process, but they are not enforceable as rights. So you and I, we, if, if we think this right has been violated, we can't go to court and say, look, I want a remedy. I want a, you know, uh, an injunction uh, or some other form of remedy against the government because they've violated this right. Now, another thing, but um, if, if, now on top of that, you've asked about the, the specific circumstances of Northern Ireland. Now that is a very difficult one, but I think one of these circumstances is that that distinguishes Northern Ireland perhaps from from other parts of the UK. Certainly, the right to hold uh, dual citizenship or just the citizenship of one country, Ireland or the UK. Uh, and I mean, I, I, I'm just thinking of Emma de Souza here and her uh, um, well uh, lived experience of of that. And I think uh, I can't think of a, of a snappy formulation now, but maybe enshrining that kind of right uh, in a human rights document uh, would be one thing that um, a, 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 and the associated rights uh, uh, that come with it uh, would be maybe something a, uh, uh, that would be specific to Northern Ireland. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Luck. I'll pass on now to Mike. Chair, thank you and Tobias. Again, thank you for your time and, and for your paper. Um, how many categories of rights are there? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, that depends on who you ask. Um, but if you look at it from a, um, the traditional view would say there are civil and political rights that are protected by one set of international treaties. And then there are economic, social and cultural rights that are protected by another set of treaties. Now, in the meantime, uh, we have uh, uh, invented or new, new rights have been come up with, uh, especially environmental rights and, of course, equality rights, if you want to see them as a separate category. Uh, but uh, the, the, the human rights lawyers will usually say, well, this is, these distinctions are, are artificial. They don't really mean that much uh, because all rights are grounded in the uh, Universal Declaration. Uh, the Universal Declaration doesn't draw the distinction between uh, economic and social and civil and political rights. And also they're all grounded in a notion of human dignity and uh, equality. When, when you joined the advisory group in, in 2018, can you tell us what the baseline was in terms of charters, conventions, commissions, etc.? cetera? What, what do you mean by baseline? How many charters were there convention? What, what was the Bill of Rights situation? I mean, was there, for example, the equivalent of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission? You, you mean in uh, Scotland? Uh, yeah. In Scotland, there is the uh, Scottish Human Rights Commission, which is a Scottish body. And on top of that, or in parallel to that, you've got the Equality and Human Rights Commission, the um, UK one. But uh, in terms of international bills of rights, I think the um, the idea was to, to mainly rely on uh, instruments that the UK has already ratified. Yeah, I guess what I'm driving at is how were you able to, and to what extent were you able to add to what already existed when you first met in 2018? 
the um, what what we are adding to is is not so much uh, or what we are aim to add to was not so much anything that didn't exist before. Uh, it was mainly trying to uh, incorporate that into domestic law. So at the moment, you've got this uh, situation where you've got the, the 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 Human Rights Act being the only um, domestic uh, statute that uh, uh, incorporates human rights into UK law uh, and also into Scottish law by that uh, by virtue of that. Um, and the idea was to add to that uh, um, in view of the Charter of Fundamental Rights disappearing. Okay, and, and final question, if I may, and it's about the balance between rights and, and individuals' responsibilities. So, for example, you know, we, we, the state has a right, you have a right to an education, uh, but there would be some responsibilities, such as you would expect a child uh, going to school to attend a certain number of days in an academic year. But you also have this, this right to, and I'm quoting here, the right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. And are we really saying it's okay for an individual not to bother doing what they need to do, you know, in terms of, say, diet and exercise? to attain that standard, but the state still needs to put the resources in just in case? That, that is a good question. I think the way this um, would be dealt with is that obviously rights are not absolute. Most of them, uh, some of them are, uh, but uh, none of these, uh, the ones you, you, you've mentioned there. So that the, these rights are not absolute. And obviously the state can provide certain uh, or will be under an obligation to provide people say with the highest attainable standard of health care that uh, which the British state the Scottish state more or less does at the moment uh, through providing the NHS free of charge um, the question then is okay do you have can, can we can we then say turn around to somebody who's been living uh, a very say a uh, 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 unhealthy lifestyle and has been warned again and again that, you know, if you do this, you know, you, you, something is going to happen to your health. Can we tell them, well, you can no longer have access to healthcare? Well, I suppose that that might be something you, you, you might want to to write into the legislation. I'm not, I'm not an expert on the on the right to healthcare, but I think uh, there are, of course, certain limits as to what is attainable. Uh, it's, it's, in, it's in the term. Of course, uh, you can't. Uh, we don't have a right to being healthy because that is not within, within uh, anybody's powers. Uh, we we might just be unlucky sometimes. But um, I think uh, it is in, in in this term attainable. What is attainable health? Uh, that there you can you can accommodate the, the the responsibility of the individual to a certain extent. I would think. Yeah, and I think it illustrates how tricky uh, the, these issues are. But Tobias, once again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your paper. Thank you. thank you. Paula. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Um, very interesting. Um, my question relates to the, you talked there about um, environmental rights, the right uh, to a healthy environment, and just wondering how that plays out in, in reality in terms of policy development. Here in Northern Ireland, we're not very good at sort of embedding environmentalism into our policies, and it's something that our programme for government has been sort of grappling with. And then the second part of that then is really as, as we leave the EU, you know, obviously th th this is a big focus for the European Union and how we actually try to keep up going forward and, and can we use our sort of uh, this process and our Bill of Rights then to sort of mirror what's happening in the EU? It's just, just more, more thoughts and if you have any come back on it, thank you. On, on the second uh, question first, perhaps, um, as, if I understand it correctly, Northern Ireland uh, has, uh, the, the environment is devolved uh, also in the Northern Irish context. So obviously Northern Ireland can do quite a lot there. Uh, of its own bat. Um, the um, the uh, Scot Scotland uh, um, adopted legislation which was struck down by the Supreme Court for, for unrelated reasons, uh, which uh, would allow a, a keeping pace power with, with, with the EU there. Um, it, I think there is nothing to prevent uh, Northern Ireland to at least try to keep pace with uh, uh, certain developments at the EU level now. Obviously, under the withdrawal agreement uh, and the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, some of that will probably have to happen anyway. So um, 
that is the that is on that on the right to a healthy environment what that would mean or what that would change is obviously i think it would need it would require the scott uh, the 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 a, a government uh, uh, to really mainstream environmental issues and environmental concerns so uh, it's uh, every piece of legislation basically would need to be checked for compliance with uh, uh, the right to a, a, a healthy environment, uh, whether the, the same measure or the same policy aim could be achieved in a more environmentally friendly manner, and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, the, the key to that would be the pre-legislative scrutiny, I think. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to do that in hindsight with courts and all of that. The courts uh, are not the best forum for that. It is really about the legislative process and already the policy formulation process at the government level that needs to be aware of these uh, kinds of or these, these these kinds of rights and then incorporate them in their thinking and uh, in their planning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Michelle. Thank you, and thank you very much for your presentation uh, and for your paper. It was it was it was very detailed and very interesting. Um, just in relation to the recommendation um, around judicial reviews and the incorporation of novel or creative remedies, could you give us a, a little bit more around what that actually would look like? Well, um, what we I mean. We haven't worked that out completely. I mean, there's just this example, uh, and the example was of of, of uh, a, 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 con, um, a spe specific new interdict, which is the Scots law term for an injunction, um, which would, for instance, you 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 have a, a local authority which is in charge of providing housing, social housing, and they don't provide any, or they provide very inadequate social housing. That is, say. Uh, not fit for human habitation, uh, mouldy and so on and so on, not very well ventilated. And you, you get a, a, a few individuals uh, that go to court, they, they, they find the money somewhere, they go to court, they um, uh, sue and they win. And obviously the local authority will say, well, we've no money. And we, you know, we'd love to give people uh, uh, nicer houses, but we don't have the money. We, we need to spend it on care, we need to spend it on roads and so on and so on. And then the court, well, of course, want to recognize that somehow should should be saying look i mean obviously we can't expect you to do this overnight but we'll give you five years to sort this out and if you don't uh, then the claimants can come back uh maybe in a, in a, in a quicker way than they ordinarily would and and and, and complain again and so uh so have these kinds of remedies that allow courts to be a bit more creative with what they're asking uh the government or local authorities to do Thank you. Um, you referenced a difference of opinion um, amongst the advisory group um, on some aspects of the work. And I suppose it will be no surprise to you that there, there's a broad range of opinions around this table. So really, I was ask, want to ask whether you had any novel or creative advice on how to achieve consensus. Um, that, that is a... Well, I, I think if I, if, I, if, I, if I find that for you, I think uh, you'll be very <laughs> pleased. But... Uh, um, I think it's it's important. I think it's important to agree on certain basic parameters. Obviously, you know, we, we were not politicians, so it's and, and you know, I mean, we're we we in that, in that sense unaccountable. And obviously, we're we're just we just made recommendations. We didn't. We're not lawmakers. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see now what comes out of this process. After all, once the political process has taken place, which will be in, in maybe two years' time, uh, if we're lucky. Um, I, I can't, uh, I think the main thing was to have people with different types of expertise around the table. We didn't know each other before, mainly. Uh, some of us, I mean, the chair knew everybody, I think, but uh, most of us didn't know each other. I personally was not a, a, an expert in uh, economic, social, cultural rights, uh, but through conversations with colleagues uh, and and. and by me and, and some others asking uh, probing questions of of, of 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 colleagues i think we came to a good uh, uh, result and we came to a good conclusion so we had a constructive work environment everybody wanted to achieve something um but uh, um i think most of us uh, or many of us came from different points of view and uh, we arrived at, at a consensus there and i think that was that was very helpful i thought uh, so i think everybody learned something from others uh, 
but I think you need to have a, a, at least a basis for a, for a constructive uh, engagement there. So that, that is the minimum you need. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, uh, Professor Locke. Oh, gee, my God, I forgot about John. Hold on. <laughs> Hold, no, he might not even be. Is he still? Uh, uh, Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Uh, thank you. Um, Professor, uh, a very interesting presentation. And, and I, I'm seeking squatters' rights because I'm new on to this committee and I'm only a substitute. So I, I, I'm enjoying, actually, this evening's or this afternoon's meeting. So I might seek permanent residence here uh, to make uh, well, it, it, it's clear to me, just listening to the presentation from yourself and from our, our, the, the Welsh present, presenter, and then last week the committee heard from, uh, his name was just skipped me, Dominic Greaves. I heard, heard from Dominic Greaves that there is a move across the islands to engage in a rights based process because there's concerns around war investments there's going and also in terms of Brexit. Now, uh, as you know, we have been at this since 98, so we haven't reached consensus, but in any negotiation, uh, I, I, I approach it on the basis of what is your, the, the person on the other side of the table's concerns and can you assist them and get with those concerns or can you uh, alleviate those concerns? And one of the concerns, rightly or wrongly, I see is, and I sure some of this, is that we end up in a society which is heavily uh, uh, based in terms of claims against the government, where we end up with more ombudsmen than we have elected representatives, and we end up with more commissioners than we have elected forums. Uh, and this is why I'm keen to explore this issue of enforceability, the enforceability of these rights, and how, how you rectify wrongs. And I note from your paper, and I'll leave in terms of your answers to Michelle previously, uh, around judicial reviews and other remedies. Uh, can, can you just further explore the remedies which uh, your body has been looking at moving forward? Well, I think it was a, a desire on our part um, because these concerns exist, not only uh, 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 in uh, in the north, but everywhere, I suppose, in, uh, and these would, would have been concerns uh, um, that will exist in Scotland as well when this goes through, uh, if if and when this goes through the uh, legislative process. Um, and I think that's why our key concern was to avoid um, judicial review where possible. Yeah, that this is only judicial review going to the courts, which is a very costly process. And a very alienating process for for most, unless you're a lawyer, uh, that this should be the very last resort. So the idea was really to, to, I mean, it's it's the way I read our recommendations. I'm reading them again a couple of weeks ago, just preparing my uh, uh, notes there. I think what we're calling for is a real paradigm shift in in terms of lawmaking and in terms of policy formulation on part of the government. That there's a human rights based approach going through everything basically so that you don't end up with problems uh, further down the line uh, where you end up before the courts so that you mainstream uh, uh, certain that you mainstream human rights based decision making uh, that that has to go through uh, happen at the at the, po at the at the policy stage before bills are brought to 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 any parliament uh, to the assembly that you have that in the assembly itself to uh, a serious pre-legislative scrutiny that is not just a box ticking exercise on on part of you know a minister like uh, under the human rights act the minister certifying that there are no problems with the human rights act which is you know everybody knows doesn't work very well uh, so that you it, it, it incorporate it there and that you also provide those who have to uh, implement the legislation, uh, which is often the local authorities who are, you know, cash strapped and and staff strapped uh, in every uh, kind of respect that they understand what they're meant to be doing uh, and so that they receive the appropriate human rights training. Now, that is a huge effort and it can't be done overnight. It can't just be, you know, the, the, the assembly can't dissolve of its uh, obligation there by just passing legislation. It's a process that will go on for years and years and years. Uh, or forever, in, in, in essence. So I think that was our main concern that, you know, I mean, that you don't end up in the courts, uh, that you don't have ombudsman writing reports that, you know, will go into the paper bin of the minister uh, at the end, 
but that you have a, an approach that everybody can buy into. Now, an important element, I think, in all of this is that the, um, the, the, the whole process of making this Bill of Rights is ideally grounded in, in the community as well, that, you, uh, it, it, that it, it doesn't become some sort of an elite project, but that it becomes a project that individuals, that the population buys into and, and is behind. And then, then, you, then you might, I mean, you know, it's, it's all very idealistic, of course, but then you might, it might just work. Okay, thank you. Is that you, John? Yes, thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much, uh, Tobias, and apologies about that. And thanks for joining us, and we'll let you go now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Bye bye. Right. We're now on to agenda number eight. So, this is the forward uh, work programme, and you'll find that starting at page 197 of your pack, are members content to note? Thank you. Yeah. So, Number 10, any other business? Do members have any other business that they want to raise? No, oh, Chair, except I think if we're having presentations, maybe we should have them initially. Take them right up and start. Yeah, so if. With people sitting in their bedrooms and <laughs> studies. And, and can I commend our, our super sub now? Did you Google David Fairclough, John? It's a big compliment. Was it uh, Scotland, Super Sub, or Super Man United? David Scotland. Super Sub for Liverpool in the probably 1980s. Uh, before my time, like David Fairclough. Um. So the next, it, if 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 everyone's happy, then that we'll do that in the future. We'll take our presentations first and deal with everything else after. We can do that. Is that okay? Right. So. The next item is date, time and place of next meeting. Our next meeting will be Thursday the 2nd of July and at that meeting we'll receive briefings from Catherine O'Regan, a former judge of the Constitutional Court of South Africa and the Commissioner for Children and Young People, Julia. So that will be at 2pm in room 29 and we are now finished. Thank you very much. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.